I'll just have my microphone on. Good evening, everyone. Gary Smith here. Uh, tonight with you, I want to thank everybody for uh, logging in with us tonight. I'm here with uh, Justin Kidd, um, and we, we've put a little uh, presentation together for you guys tonight. Um, this is a uh, kind of by popular man, man kind of thing. Uh, the while we're waiting for uh, Justin to come up, we'll uh, give you a little background on this and then get started. Uh, let's see, we've got a okay. Ah, there's Justin. All right, hold on, I'm just reading some stuff. Um, okay, so we're here with you tonight. Justin's on with us. Uh, I want to welcome Justin Kidd, ATS Carbon Clean. Uh, my name is Gary Smith. Um, we did this uh, this class tonight for you guys for one specific reason. Um, some of you know, and some of you have attended the deposits and diagnostic class that Diagnation and myself have been teaching around the country. And the overwhelming uh, number of people that feed back on those classes come down and ask specific questions about um you know ab about uh, how a specific system works with the carbon removal how different products work and what happens to us when we're trying to do this either at a trade show or in a class is so many people use so many different products it's very difficult to get them the answers they're seeking at the class for example how does the ats system actually affect the uh, carbon on the valves and the intake. So what we thought would be a neat idea tonight to do would be to put together a little class that rides along with the deposits and diagnostics class so we can look at this system diagnostically tonight real quick. Um, and then we've gone ahead and put together a couple of case study cars for you, two or three case study cars that were actually done by us with pictures and data captured and everything so that we can kind of bring the argument full circle and show you how and why the uh, ATS chemistry, both on the intake side and on the ring cleaner, oil cleaner side, as well as the injector cleaner that goes in the tank, what it is, how it works, and how it applies to the car in the real world. So Justin, do you want to add anything to that before I start flipping slides? Because Bubby, we got a lot of information to cover tonight, and we got to get rolling here. No, let it rip. Keep going, Gary. Okay. All right, cool. So um, I'm going to shut this webcam off so that I don't have that distraction. Um, let's get this question bar out of the way and we'll get going. Okay, now we're going to get started here. Um, what I want to do is just kind of lay some groundwork for what we're talking about here. Um, we're going to kind of take a little bit of that class and lay the baseline for what we're actually doing on these two, three vehicles that we're going to be talking about tonight and kind of try to tie all that information together. Obviously, we're going to be focusing this particular session on the ATS uh, uh, 3C machine from Carbon ATS Carbon Clean. Now, basically what we're going to be seeking to do is the same thing we would seek to do with any kind of carbon removal service using chemistry guys and that might be a bg a winds a justice brothers or this ats system and that goal is to restore airflow in the gdi engine around these valves where we learned from the deposits class the tumble and swirl that's used by the engineer uh, when he designs the airflow into that very tightly controlled gas direct injection engine is where the drivability really starts to go away on these cars. So what you're going to see tonight is not only how the deposits are getting there real quick, we're just going to cover a real brief on that. I know some of you have sat through the class, but some of you haven't. And that's going to require uh, me to just lay a little groundwork here. But here you can see our first one, one example here is a picture of just this small amount of interruption on a valve this is a, a not a you know 200,000 mile clogged up monster like we see come into our shop sometimes but even this car had drivability uh and the goal of the service is not necessarily to bring every single piece of that intake back into a shiny clean new 
position. But the goal of any of these services, no matter who the manufacturer is, is to remove these obstructions, smooth out the airflow paths where act air actually charges into that cylinder. And what we're going to do tonight is take some scan tool data from these cars that we worked on uh, and some other things, excuse me, and we're going to go ahead and um, you know, get some answers as to how effective is this system. Now, some of the industry issues that we're talking about, guys, um, where, you know, uh, we're just getting pummeled with these over and over again is going to be what you see on your screen here. And that's going to relate to turbo failure, where we see the coking on the veins and the supply tubes. We're going to be talking about injectors and high pressure pumps, catalytic converter failures, O2 and air fuel ratio sensor failures, variable valve timing is going to be a big part of our discussion tonight, as is ring health. And you're going to see when we get to the ring part, the ring cleaning part of this, this is an astounding thing to pay attention to in your diagnostics, because a lot of guys are getting bitten by this with these problematic codes, such as intermittent misfires, lean codes, rich codes, oxygen sensor switch time codes, and catalytic deficiency codes, right? As well as the well-known problem we have today, guys, which is really plaguing our industry, which is timing chain failure, cam timing problems, phaser problems, oil control issues, that kind of stuff. So these are the issues that we wanna key in on tonight. Obviously these carbons, no matter where they grow in the engine, okay, and how they grow in the engine goes to the drive cycle and what we're actually feeding the engine. We're gonna get, get, get to that here in a second. But this carbon that's building up, no matter where it's building up in the system, is creating problems in airflow and tumble in the engineered swirl and the fuel control of the car. And what's happening here, quite, on, uh, you know, quite honestly and quite frankly, ties directly to just about every single drivability problem we're tracking down in that shop. So when we get beyond the swapping of the coils on that misfire, it's time to buckle down on some of this information and figure out if deposits are creating our problem. I know you guys already know this is a huge issue no matter whose product you use. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. This is like one of the biggest hot button issues on the internet right now is how do we identify, remove, and successfully manage this carbon issue in our customers' gas direct injection cars. So you can see the list on the screen is giving us a whole number of drivability issues that will start to creep into this car as it builds up depositing. And this is where using our scopes and our scan tool data becomes very, very useful in taking a product like this and helping to use it in the diagnostic and repair realm once the car already is in trouble. But more importantly, what I want you guys to get out of this tonight is that if we take a system like this or any system that we use in our shop, and we target it toward the diagnostic end, we learn that we really need to be targeting the customer toward the maintenance end as well. Because half the time when we're unburying these problems in the car, it's a lack of maintenance that got it there. So we can see on the screen, a couple that I really wanna key in on here are fuel economy issues and lean and rich codes, but also a very common complaint is this lower one where there's no codes associated and the customer says, my car just doesn't have the guts and the get up and go it used to. Well, we're going to show you tonight that's very much largely created by deposit buildup in that engine and we can identify it and go fix it quickly so i'm not going to do this whole class or spend time on every bullet point on these slides i want to build a case for the case study cars we're going to be showing you tonight but i do want to identify real quickly what these fuel deposits are because they are in different areas of the engine on these vehicles meaning they're on the back of the throttle plate, they're in the intake runners, they're actually on the intake valves, as you saw on that opening slide. Um, but they're also building up inside that very precise GDI injector. We've got deposits starting in the fuel tank and going all the way through to the exhaust and the catalytic converters. So if I could just take a second and identify the four types of deposits we're gonna actually be seeking to find and eradicate using a system like this, it would be the four main deposits that you'll find from any oil or fuel combustion um, or use or heat, okay? So that goes to our lubrication oil, our fuels and all that. So what we're gonna be dealing with here in the front of this presentation tonight is the gummy deposits and the fuel deposits and how the gasoline actually creates that. And more importantly than the gasoline creating it, how that customer is using the car creates it. 
And what I mean by that is you're going to see in the next few slides that the ethanol fuel that we're being mandated to burn in this country right now has a tremendous propensity to break down uh, and phase separate under long-term storage conditions. So you're going to learn tonight, we're going to learn, and I've learned big time over the last 20 years of doing this with various vehicles and looking at this data, that the customer who is a very short trip driver or is very, uh, you know, only five to seven miles on the way to work every day and then back home into the church on Sundays, meaning they're not burning a lot of fuel out of that car, um, those customers are really susceptible to this gummy deposit here, which is really problematic, okay? Now, once that gummy deposit goes up in through the injectors, it starts to change physical state. And again, this isn't a full-on deposits class, but I want to set the stage for what we're going after because the drive cycle and what we're feeding it equals how difficult it is to track down and or repair or fix these deposits using these methods. Now, once that gets into the injector, it starts to change its physical state into a varnish, and that varnish starts to occur and really affect more than anything the center of the body of the actual injector itself. This is where the deposit starts to change form and start to change its physical state into a harder carbon. But because that injector is where it is, the inside body of the injector does get some varnish buildup where the top of the injector or the inlet screen gets the gummy deposit following, which can cause lean codes. So please follow me through this because this is significant in diagnostics. Now, those varnish deposits move down further through the injector. I've got a slide on that that I'll blow through real quick just to kind of show you physically what's going on. Um, and now it's going to reach down at the pintle and be squirted into the combustion chamber. This is the area of the bottom of the injector and the entire combustion chamber area that does get affected with the hard carbon, which to be very clear in this webinar, is the gummy deposit we're gonna start with in the tank that's now changed forms and burned through combustion and physically changed its state into a hard cookie-like carbon that's now attached itself to the inside of the runners, the valves, the piston crowns, the rings, the rings are gonna be a huge thing we get to tonight. And then the final deposit that we have to really think about in today's gas direct injection cars, guys, when we're talking about deposit removal is the soot particulate. Because of how we're fueling these vehicles and how we're burning these vehicles, they're actually fueling and burning far more closely in theory to a high pressure diesel than they do to a gasoline traditional engine we're used to working on. And as such, they have a tremendously high soot load in these gas direct injection engines. This is causing the problem in a lot of our post combustion following of things like the oxygen sensors, air fuel ratio sensors, and the actual catalytic converter itself. So we're also gonna show you how a system like this can, when used with maintenance after a cleanup, be very, very impactful for that customer in keeping those kind of problems out of their paradigm. And of course, whenever we can do that, we go from zero to hero very quickly. Now, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this. Those of you that have seen my class have seen me do this slide. But what I do wanna do uh, real quick, if I can, um, if I can get my little, oh, I got a, I was wondering why my pen wasn't working and that's because my little pad wasn't hooked up. Okay, now what I wanna key in on is we're not gonna go through a big dissertation on this thing. What I want you to really key in on though is this cracking unit. I'm gonna lay out a very 30 second version of what's going on that's creating the, the uh, extensive multiplicity of this carbon. I don't know how else to, in other words, it grows so fast in these cars today. One of the reason for that is tolerances, but the other reason is what you have on the screen which is the EPA regulated RFG fuel that they're asking us to burn. If you'll notice, you've got your eight char carbon chain gas band here, right? What they're gonna do is take this crude oil and boil it, and they're gonna hold the hots down here um, where you see the red to let the lighter elements come up the column through the baffles at very specific temperatures. For example, for gasoline at about 125 Celsius, that will naturally come off this pipe at eight carbon chains. This is a gasoline product that we would burn. But the EPA, the illustrious eggheads at the EPA 
have given us the RFG blend by mandate. Now, because we have to crack further down into that barrel of oil that you're looking at here, which is 42 gallons, okay, when it's traded on the commodities market, this distillation process can process up to 57 to 59 gallons of liquid fuel. Now, how they do that is, um, if I don't have enough gasoline here, we're gonna go lower into the heavier oils, so your lubricating oil stocks and your bunker fuel stocks, and throw those heavy stocks into a hydro cracker and crack it with hydrogen under very wet, steamy conditions. Then we're gonna bring it up this pipe, and you notice here we're crossing the eight carbon chain band, and we're bringing that reformed fuel base into a higher area of the distillation column, and we're reforming that fuel, hence the name reformulated gas, in the reformer. Now what's going on there, guys, is they're adding the light elements of the fuel to the heavier cracked base, so that at the end of production, they come out here with a manufactured eight carbon chain E10 RFG fuel that's legal. Now, here's the problem. Told you I wasn't gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, but 90% of the precursors we see for carbon buildup in today's engines start right in the fuel tank based on a chemical reaction that happens from this distillation process, which is the infusion of a precursor water molecule in that hydro crack fuel base. Now let's take that thought and move on, okay? The gummy deposits that we get, which are gonna be these guys, these gorilla snots right here are the gummy deposits, okay, that are happening because of this process. The longer that fuel sits in storage, the more of that gummy deposit starts to come up through the fuel filter and into the tops of the injectors. Now, no matter what kind of filtration this vehicle has, those deposits are still gonna make it to the inlet screens of the injectors. Why? Because it's a gummy paraffin wax at that point. It's not like a grain of dirt or salt that the filter can stop. So that deposit is slowly gonna pull up through the filtration and start loading itself into the engine. Now, as you can see on this slide, it's gonna keep moving. It's going to go through the entire primary fuel system, including the high pressure pump, which is also screened, I might add, and to the injectors. Now, if you consider this, we're gonna to start to move this deposit through the engine and take a look at how that's affecting the data in the scan tool and the drivability of the car. But here is the Gorilla Snot slide that basically is showing you the precursor for what we are now going into this motor and digging out as a hard carbon cookie. It all starts there. The second place it starts is in the piston rings, but that's a little further along in the presentation. Now, Justin, did you have anything you wanted to add to this point? I just wanted to know, is a gorilla snot a technical term? The gorilla snot is a highly technical term, but that does require somewhat of a college education to break it down. So we'll try not to cover the gorilla snot tonight. <laughs> okay, but great question. I appreciate you asking that. Now, um, so on the injector, guys, this is the one area of the vehicle that we really need to target on in our diagnostic thought, but also in our cleanup strategy. And the reason is very evident. If we are getting this gorilla snot that's now traveling up and landing in the screen areas of the injector under pressure, I might add, we're going to start to get a restriction of fuel. Okay, well, Let's start thinking in terms of drivability and baselining here. We have a lot of these ghost lean codes that are occurring today where guys are going nuts, smoking intakes and having a blast with the EVAP controls and variable valve timing and all this, trying to figure out what the leak is. And it, it's not a leak at all. It'll turn out sometimes to be an overly restricted set of injectors. I ran into one of these very situations last week on a Chevy Cobalt where we had two dealerships and two independent shops throw about every part they could think of throwing at this car, and yet that lean code existed. And the customer, poor customer that was going through all this, getting bounced around the city of Dallas, couldn't get their car inspected because of the lean code. Turns out in the final analysis, guys, did take me a while to figure it out, but it was an entire set of injectors that were so contaminated like this that even a cleaning wouldn't solve it, and we ended up having to put a set in. But my point is, this is where it all starts on the top of the engine with the gummy deposit. The bottom of the engine is going to start with that 
hard carbon building up in the ringlands. And again, we're going to get to that in a minute. But follow this through the system because this is where we get drivability. Now we can get some drivability up in here, some, some lean codes, some restrictions, some hesitations when we jump on that gas pedal. Okay. But when we talk in terms of a GDI with a very high current injector running at high voltages, when they wear out, what's really wearing them out that in, that I've seen in my estimation is two things. If they stop working electrically, they're usually heat damaged and they're heat damaged because the varnish, as it will build up in here, will actually slowly restrict or put a higher load on that injector um, uh, magnet or, or iron piece of the solenoid that's toggling up and down the injector's opening. If you continue to load that and load it and load it and bring your current up, up and up, you're going to burn out something, guys. And we've seen it all, haven't we? We've seen an open winding on an injector where it simply won't fire anymore. But in today's cars, we're also seeing that that heat damage can cause a lot of damage to the driver and the PCM that's controlling it. This is, <laughs> excuse me, this is something I'm catching in the support side of the business lots of times now. So this injector is critical for this deposit discussion. Now down at the bottom, we can also obviously see that our hard carbon deposits are going to really be following our pintle holes here and creating either a dribble of fuel or what we see a lot is uh, you've got nozzles over here clogged. So all of the fuel is spraying out here and it's quenching on the cylinder wall and falling to where the piston is sitting there. Okay, so that fuel unburned is now sitting here in that condition. So guys, if we take this down the pathway of a what I call a uh, slow path of drivability destruction with the slow buildup of these deposits, now the question comes becomes, how do I go as a tech and identify this with my equipment and if I do identify something and I clean it up, can I go back in and measure it when I'm done to see what I actually affected on the car? The answer is yes, very clearly yes. Now, here's something I wanna point out before we move off the injector slide. There's a huge debate right now online, guys, of technicians that are debating, you know, a BG or an ATS3C system chemically, or are we going to tear this motor apart and walnut shell blast it? Well, the Euro guys are really fans of your walnut shell blasting, and I get why. A lot of these cars are so badly coked up when we get them that it would take two or three passes sometimes of that chemistry to remove everything. So in some of those cases, I'm totally okay with a walnut shell blast. But here's what I want to make very, very clear about the walnut shell debate, and that is this. Those that are doing this deposit removal using walnut shells on the valves only and hand cleaning the intakes are really missing the boat on drivability. Why? Because we're not necessarily doing that walnut shell blaster. We're not taking care of these injectors most of the time. Most of the time. Some guys are on a regimen of throwing a, a CRO fuel treatment or a 44K if they're using BG or whatever, right, into the tank. Some guys are doing that in the Euro world. But overwhelmingly, I see these cars getting the intakes taken off, walnut shell blast, put it that back together, road test it, and ship it. Here's the problem. You're not affecting the drivability side or the fuel control correction side of that uh, fuel side when you're not addressing the injectors. So if you're a walnut shell guy, please consider what we're showing you here and begin to think about getting some of the fuel injector chemistry into that fuel tank to do this part of the job on the cleanup. It's very critical, as you'll see going along here, especially for this reason, because when we have this going on, that is a sure idle shake or beginnings of a drivability misfire and for sure a hesitation and a rough idle. So guys, when we're seeing these ghost problems, don't discount those injectors. We've been bit, bitten many times by them on these ghost code drivability diagnostics, especially in GDI cars. Now, what's the answer there? It's a simple one. In this case, with the ATS system, you're going to use the 505 CRF. I've got this wrong. You notice I got the oil number up here. It's actually 505 CRF, guys, if you're making a note of it. 
which is your fuel pour in treatment. That's gonna be what goes in here in the ATS system and physically takes care of the Gorilla Snot, the varnish, and do the best it can, provided that injector is not fully clogged to clean and free up the nozzles in that car. I can tell you from my own personal experience when Bernie uh, ha introduced me to this product and shipped me all the original equipment back a year and a half ago when he started this, that I threw a can of this into my wife's SRX, Cadillac SRX, and did nothing else except throw that in. And man, I was blown away by the fact that the idle smoothed out within about a day and a half of driving. And a week later, my wife came to me and said, I don't know what the heck you did to my car, but the dashboard's showing that it's getting three and a half miles a gallon better fuel economy. Well, I said to her, I didn't do anything. And she goes, well, you had it up for an oil change. I go, oh yeah, we did do something. We poured that fuel treatment in. She says, well, whatever that stuff is made out of, it works. Now I know that's anecdotal, but that's my own wife's car. We threw it in as a course of maintenance just to try it out. It really works. <clears throat> if you want to see it work so you can get excited about presenting it to your customer, put it in your own car and check it out. Justin, you want to go over this real quick, your instructions here, and uh, just let the guys know when we want to do that. Sure. Um, you know, just to just to make a, a note from before with you're talking about the walnut blasting and everything, um, you know, one of the things we're seeing too is, and I've done walnut shell blasting as well, you have to take all those components off. And I know everybody right. knows knows that. Um, but when you're removing some of those components, some of those injectors don't want to come out anymore. So if there's an issue with that injection system, but maybe it can be cleared up without um, an invasive, you know, teardown, you know, we can actually take care of something like that in a couple of different methods, which is what we're talking about tonight. Sure. Um, so, you know, to, to your point, um, we do recommend, you know, we're, we're putting this into about a half in tank uh, to a quarter of a tank if we're doing this as, you know, kind of a, a repair, you know, if we're looking for something like customers complaining of, a, a, you know, a little bit of a lumpy idle. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're using this as a treatment versus as a preventative. So about a half a tank to a quarter of a tank is what we're recommending to do that. Um, okay. As a maintenance item, you know, putting this in every other service uh, and recommending this to your customers is usually about, about right. Um, and to, to note that this does work on diesels and petrol uh, systems. So Petrol, there's no different. Yeah, that's my, the, the Euro uh, for the Euro guys, right? So I'm a Euro guy. Um, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Thanks, Gary. Fantastic. All right. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be on the fuel side. So that's how uh, the system goes after those fuel side deposits that we were talking about. Now, let's just roll in. We got about a half hour left to do diagnosing these deposits, okay? How are we getting the answer when the car actually comes in and drivability? And this is a big part of time that we spend in our drivability and diagnosis of deposits class, but I wanna to touch on it tonight because it's gonna lead into the data that we captured on our, on our test cars here. So what we wanna think about here is leveraging the data that the PCM delivers and specifically concentrating on the baseline theory, baseline diagnostics. What does that mean? We'll get into it here as we go. Now, this is just a graphic um, that basically shows, you know, a valve dirtying up, okay? But what we're really after here, guys, with the diagnosis is what is this doing to our combustion, to the firing event in that cylinder? What are we doing in relation to drivability here? How does a lean interrupt this? How does um, the tumble and swirl, for example, that is designed into this cylinder, that is specifically designed to catch this injection and hold it right here under the spark plug, okay? How does a big ball of carbon like this on the valve interrupt this flow and this swirl and knock it down so that we have raw fuel hitting that piston? That's what we need to go find out. And the, the OBD2 data will tell you if you start to look at these consistently the same way, car over car over car. It will start to tell you a story. Now, what I use and what a lot of us use out there right now, you know, it's very common tool and I use it because it's fast and easy is the e-scan. Okay, the e-scan is awesome because of the fuel trim charts. It can help me with bank to bank diagnosis. 
lean on one side, rich on the other, that kind of thing. I can also look and see whether I've got a lower block problem indicating a vacuum leak or a total engine problem here like we see here. And then on the air side, I like to use this tool. And I'm going to show you how to do this with a regular scan tool, so don't worry. But I like to use this because I have it and because it's really fast and easy to get the answers I need. On our volumetric efficiency chart here, we've got a red trace and a yellow trace. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing to check air side interruptions relating to these deposits, guys, because if we go out and we've got air intake problems, this yellow line is not going to match the red, and this chart over here to the right is going to show us how far off in percentage that mass airflow signal is. Beautiful, beautiful tool for going after this kind of drivability problem. But the other thing that we're using a lot these days is our scopes and transducers and vacuum transducers, as well as pressure transducers in the engine, as some of you know and practice right now. But, you know, when we're going after a drivability related to these deposits, these waveforms can be very, very helpful. And not only that, but they can help you nail the problem very definitively if you become a student of the business and practice how to do it on car over car over car. The problem with this technology is a lot of guys don't lean on it until it's too late. And what I mean by that is they're into a problem on a car, they're looking for a magic bullet solution, and that scope's coming out as a last resort. I would submit to you based on what I've been seeing around the industry for years now related to deposits, this should be step one, two, and three in your diagnostic procedure to check with this stuff, not step 12 after we've got the barrel of the parts cannon all heated up, as I like to jokingly say right because you can see here if we had the proper chart to you know go over and we had the time to go over with this tonight and we could chart it for you we can actually go in with an ignition reference and tell which cylinder this is that's falling so short contribution wise in the vacuum pole right and if we look at it in the right resolution we can see uh for example on bernie scope the way this draws out is a very hashy waveform that's uneven here some of you guys will recognize this uh, graphic from doing it yourself, quite frankly. All right. Now, here's the beautiful thing about baselining and using scope data and scan data to check your before and after, after activity when you're doing these cleanups from a repair standpoint, not a maintenance standpoint or a diagnostic standpoint. If we take the tool that's as simple as a vacuum sensor that we can put on the scope and throw onto a vacuum line, and we can diagnose down to that cylinder here with dirty intake seats, okay, and then clean the engine and confirm it here with the same tool 20 minutes later. What have we done there diagnostically? We've actually not just used a maintenance product or system to help us get out of a drivability problem, but we confirmed it was there, and then we confirmed we fixed it. The same thing applies to the scan data we're going to go over here in a minute, okay? But, you know, in situations like this, we've got so many mechanical issues creeping up, up into our diagnostic paradigm now based on these deposits that we've actually started to use not just a vacuum waveform that we showed on the last slide, but more specifically the in-cylinder waveform that we have here on the screen now. Now, what's very significant about using this for diagnostics, I'm going to walk you through this really quick, is let's say I'm doing a misfire, just as an example, a random misfire that is not a dead hole. So this thing's just, mm, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, and it's falling out every once in a while. Okay, if we take a vehicle like that, all right, and we apply this testing technology to it, some of us are really good with this waveform already, but some are just learning it. I just want to show you when it relates to the, the deposit diagnostics, how powerful this can be. First of all, if I have a low cylinder, I'm going to have low running compression here. Okay. But the big area I'm keyed in on here is right here in the gas exchange area of this waveform. What I can do real quickly with this in the drivability realm to check for carbon fouling and deposits is pretty quick testing here, and it tells the story. First, we look at the compression, 
Then we want to note how equal the intake and exhaust poles occur. Now, this can't be a class on how this waveform works, and some of you already use it and some don't, but I just want to cover with you where I get my answers that I need real quick, drivability down and dirty when I'm in the bay. It's at the bottom of the waveform. If I take a cursor and I run it across the bottom of these two pockets, we can pretty safely say that if they match or are very close to matching, that cylinder is able to pull the same vacuum on the exhaust stroke over here as it is on the intake stroke. And we know because we're mechanics and technicians that if the engine is leaking a valve, it's going to have a net effect on either one or both of those strokes. In other words, if it's leaking on the intake side, it can't pull, uh, pull vacuum on the exhaust side and vice versa. So this is a beautiful test to see if I have valve leakage uh, that is great enough to cause my misfire. The rule of thumb here is if we have much more of a separation between this pocket and this pocket of about two pounds, from what I've learned from Bernie on his you know, design and study of this methodology, around two pounds, you're gonna start to almost guarantee yourself either an intermittent or a dead hole misfire of leakage. Now I go into these engines frequently in the support side of the business guys, and I'm measuring three and three and a half pounds of leakage all day long with the bottom of this waveform. Listen guys, when it comes to this subject and deposits and diagnostics, when you've got a leak like that, what I do next is run a boroscope in, and 95% of the time, I'm gonna see a ice cream cone ball of snot sitting on that valve. At that point, guys, my diagnosis is done until I clean that engine. Why? Because if I continue to diagnose it and continue to try to put parts at it to fix a condition I can see here mechanically, it's not gonna be a good day for me with that customer or with my time in the bay. So if I see this, I'm not going to want to engage with that customer in any more repairs or parts swapping until we get that addressed. How do we address it? Great question I just asked myself, isn't it? Here's how I address it. I tell the customer right here at this stage of the diagnosis that I'd like to get the engine clean because I can see a problem with this, which would directly relate to my code or no code condition that the car is in front of me for. Now, most customers will listen to a technician's advice and do that. Some will push back and argue. It's up to you guys to figure out how to make that argument. Technically speaking, what I'm telling you for me over the years is I've learned to stop right there and clean the car. Why? One of two things is going to happen. If I identify the carbon snot with my boroscope after this, I know I have a really good shot at cleaning the car up and actually having a positive net effect on my drivability concern. And I'm taking those deposits off the table as a, if I have to continue to diagnose, I now don't have to worry about if that's causing the problem. Furthermore, I can know if it helped the problem simply by taking this same measurement after I'm done. But let me show you something interesting. The beautiful thing about diagnosing your deposits with this technology and your scan tool is you've got visuals here, baby, meaning that's a bad one that's leaking real bad. If we can't tell the difference between this healthy waveform here, okay, with the nice sharp cuts and nice gas exchange pockets, and this one, we got to, you know, this is a beautiful tool for diagnosing this. Now, here you can see I have my lower white cursor here touching this pocket and my upper cursor touching the exhaust pocket. And here we can see 3.003 pounds of leakage. That is one badly misfiring cylinder right now. So much so that as the compression the piston starts to push up on compression, we're actually leaking these valves so bad it can't even really hold compression, as you can see here, as that piston is moving up toward top dead center. In addition, the compression's so bad here because of this leakage, we got wobblies on the compression towers, which in a healthy engine will be very symmetrical and razor straight. So guys, we can put our ignition reference on top of this and our injector reference and time the way everything's running on the engine, check for leakage, look at our compression and our ring health all at the same time on the same screen. By the way, this indication here is not just only of leakage, 
It's a very dirty, stuck rings. This car was this car after a cleanup. This was not a car, I wanna be clear for tonight's class, this was not a car Justin and I just did for this class. These are two slides from a case study I did on the class earlier that I ran. But guys, if you wanna know how accurately and quickly you can nail these problems down by just getting your head out of that scanner for a minute and into the mechanical engine for one quick test right here, okay? This is 10 minutes of quick analysis that gets you the mechanical issue on or off the table in your diagnostic very quickly. That's the point I'm trying to make. And it's very powerful to do so. So here you can see we've got a good running waveform and a very gnarly bad running waveform. And I've shown you now how to quickly measure for that valve leakage and then go in with your boroscope, visually confirm it, and then go ahead and sell your cleanup before you take this diagnostic too much further on that ghost lean code or that ghost misfire. Believe me, I got guys on the support line all the time that I do this work with for 20 minutes and I have to ask them to clean the car. And they're like, what do you mean clean the car? And I'm like, dude, clean the car before we go one step further. And you can't believe how many times it fixes it, okay? So here we're also seeing on the slide that because of this valve leakage, this car is taking a very long time to pull into the bottom of its intake pull. And all this time that we're missing between cursor one and cursor two is time that this engine should be sucking in a healthy dose of air to fire that cylinder. This is why this is such an important waveform to consider. But here's how you catch your intermittence, guys, if you haven't figured this out already with this waveform. Look at this resolution I'm looking at here. If I do all my work zoomed in, yeah, I might catch this one right here, but I'm gonna miss how repetitive this is. If we just take for a second and count, we have one, we'll call this zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, drop. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, drop. You see what I'm showing you here? When that thing is running, and I want to be very clear about this. It's 842 and we got a bunch more to cover. So I'm going to fly after I get off this slide. But I want to be very clear about this. I get calls on this all the time, guys. The static uh, compression leak down test will not catch this problem you see on the screen. Why? Because when we're turning that engine by hand, it is not rotating fast enough or with enough force to rotate those valves in the cylinder head. And this is exactly what is causing the intermittent misfire on this engine is the valve is missing its seat because of deposits in one portion of the rotation of that valve. This can be very accurate because I can now count eight engine strikes between misfire events and conclusively, conclusively attribute that to valve leakage that's due to deposit fouling in the rotation of the valve if that makes sense guys i catch cars like this all the time after people are up against the wall with it so this stuff's really important when you're going to put a chemical system and a cleanup system to work for you be able to target identify repair and confirm that's big time diagnostics guys so here's a zoomed in version of this Okay, and this is where we will zoom in further to this level to get these measurements, guys. But th this is a real deal diagnostic tool for you. Bernie did a great job inventing and patenting this technology, just so most of you know already. But, um, you know, we have tons of manufacturers out there that are now offering this. Pico has it, Snap on has a version of transducers. I like this version. You know, I'm, I'm, partial to it like people are to their snap-ons or their picos because this is very very targeted diagnosis and i love the way that bernie scope uh is flat rate friendly that's why i use it just because it's quick and easy and this is the kind of data i can get out of that diagnostic very quickly so baseline let's just uh by the way i want to acknowledge i see a couple questions over here if i stop to answer them right now 
Um, we're going to be way late. So if you can just please bear with me and hang on to that question, I'll get to each one of them that I can at the at the end, okay? But I want to just throw that baseline thought process into our mind for the rest of this. And that is that we have to have a starting point. That's what our baseline is. We're going to consider so we can fly through this and get to the good stuff, that the baseline is what that car was reading when it was fresh and clean and new out of the factory. That's the thing we got to get in our mind with looking at baseline data. What should that car be doing? What was it doing when it was clean and fresh and not clogged up versus what it's doing in front of me now? This is where the before and after of a cleanup of carbon can be very impactful in telling us where we got in that diagnosis and that repair. So we're gonna take the baseline thought process as a clean starting point. Wherever that OBD2 data was on a warmed up, fresh, clean car, is what we want our minds thinking about in terms of baseline here, guys. What should the car be doing versus what is it doing in front of me right now? And once I cleaned it, what result did I get? That is the big tell right there, okay? So we can make that fuel system clean, to, uh, the system talk to us before and after a cleanup, and we can get a lot of diagnostic answers that way. There are several eight engine data pids that I personally use to get this done, I'm going to share them with you tonight. You guys may have some uh, some other things that you use. And if you want, when we're done and then we're in the question and answer period, I'd love it if you'd hit your raise hand icon, unmute your mic, and tell us what your secrets are. That's the beautiful thing about a session like this tonight is that when it's over, we can say, hey, you know, what I've learned to do is this, and this works really well for me. So I look forward to that if you guys want to participate in the question and answer afterwards. Now, here's the data PIDs I use to let the vehicle tell me its story. I'm gonna always start with long-term fuel trim or Lambda, depending on the car I'm working on, all right? The reason I wanna use long-term fuel trim, and Bernie will teach to use total fuel trim, and I totally agree with that too, is so that we can look at the total adjustments on the car, uh, short and long-term fuel trim-wise, if we choose to. But for baseline diagnostics, what I'm very interested in is the trending of the car and what it's been doing long term or the trend of what that fuel system is walking to and doing to adjust for these deposits in the car. So yes, when I'm diagnosing rich and lean and where the problem is, I totally agree with the theory of total fuel trim. But for this, I can use either total fuel trim or more specifically, I like to use long term because it's more indicative of the trend. So here you can see a car, you know, the car cleaned, um, before cleaning actually, is at a, a long-term fuel trim adjustment of negative 13%. Throttle motor, I want to use that in the baseline diagnostics for, for deposits because here's what we know, guys. What we know is as the car dirties up and let's say the ring of snot builds up on the back of that throttle plate that we've been cleaning for years and all the intake runners get clogged up and the injectors start getting clogged up, what are we looking at here diagnostically on the screen if we're thinking baseline? What we're looking at is what that computer, what that vehicle's PCM has had to do to adjust for the environmental conditions in the engine right now. Now, taking away for this argument that we have a sensor or electrical problem driving that data, if we don't, uh, then I can promise you that what you're looking at on the screen is the combination of mechanical wear built up on the engine and the fuel system adjusting off of baseline <clears throat> to correct for these carbonaceous problems in the combustion chamber and the interruption of airflow around that critical valve we were talking about. So the other data pit I really like to key in on here is engine load, okay? I need to know what my throttle percent open is for a correlation I'm gonna show you in a minute that's very critical to getting an answer for the customer that's almost unanswerable right now, so bear with me. But that engine load's important. The higher the carbon load in the engine, the higher the load will read at idle. I've proven that hundreds and hundreds of times over 20 years doing this method of diagnostics and then cleanup. It's provable right to your very own eyes. Part of you guys going through this tonight with the ATS system is to learn how to do this for yourself. Here's what I did. When I first got the system, I used it on my wife's car, my car, my spare Volvo wagon, and then I took it to shops to show people. Why? 
because if I'm going to sell something or I'm going to look a fellow tech or shop owner in the eye, I want to make sure what I'm selling works. The way G. Smith tells how it works is data. Okay. And that goes for anybody's stuff. If you walk in my shop and you say, I want to show you this fuel injection cleaner, I'll be showing you if it works using this method. Okay. Now let's get to that injector pulse. This is where we correlate the throttle open reading against this for this complaint. Fuel economy. Technicians hate to get that complaint because there's generally no code associated with it and the car's running fine, right? No code's running fine. Data looks okay. It'll never look okay to you after this, but the data looks okay in a normal diagnosis and we put the car out with a no condition found. Let me ask you a question, guys, right here and right now. If we take the principles of fuel control and fuel injection into account, whether it's a carbureted car or a fuel injected car, wouldn't you guys agree that if I have to continuously slowly move idle air uh, to correct for deposit buildup, I can't just move the idle air, can I? I got to move the fuel with it a little bit or it'll be stumbling, bumbling, lean on one side or it'll be excessively rich on the other. Right. So with that basic technical truth in mind, if we correlate the throttle opening at 6% and look at our injector pulse here at 997 milliseconds, Okay, on a car like a Mini like this, this thing should really be running at about eight tenths of a millisecond. It's running near 1.0 milliseconds. I know because I look at these all the time. That's significantly off baseline. Why is it off baseline? This, okay, that injector cannot work at its highest efficiency and highest fuel efficiency if it's running too high right out of the gate at idle because all these deposits have built up in the engine. Fact, absolute fact. Now, just to take that fact one step further, when we have a fuel economy complaint on a car, if I can identify these two conditions are true in the baseline diagnostic strategy, my question is this, if I'm starting the pulse width high, the pulse width is never going to go down or get more efficient when I step on the gas. The pulse width, as we know, is going to expand and deliver for more fuel. Therefore, guys, what I'm showing you is if this thing is consuming 19% more fuel at idle because of these conditions, it's you divide that number in half and it is consuming about 9 to 10% more fuel than it should be through the whole RPM load operating range of that car. You want a way to quantify truthfully for a customer why that car's got a poor fuel mileage complaint with no codes. That's it right there. So in this case, how do I tell the customer to get rid of this problem? I could be dishonest and sell them tune-ups, spark plugs, filters, and a million other things before I get to this, or I can take my new diagnostic strategy for these complaints, identify this quickly, sell the right service, and become a hero, not a zero. That's what I'm getting at. Here's another thing, guys. I use ignition advance and retard data in a big way and smooth running values. You're gonna see why. So hopefully you're writing those down so you can start to practice this yourself. Now let's look at oil control real quick. This I wanna make very clear, guys, is the number one start of the vicious cycle of damage on any GDI or high pressure diesel engine. Right here, what you're looking at. It all 100% starts there in the base engine for degradation of all of this data that we're seeing here. It starts at the rings and then it feeds with the injector gorilla snot that I covered in the first part of the class. This oil problem is the one number one most overlooked thing technicians deal with when they're looking at these drivability concerns. And it's why, it's 90% of why all your GDIs are getting in trouble in rapidly carbonizing engines. Follow me through this. Here's a 38,000 mile Lexus, okay? I want to point out this is 38,000 miles and we have a deposit built up so bad it's smacking itself into the valve guide here that's creating that L-shaped uh, little notch in this deposit. This thing is smacking itself into the valve guide at 38,000 miles. We've got substantial carbon built up in the rings and on the top of the piston crowns and the valve reliefs. This engine 
has such a problem with this, it was under recall from Lexus. Their answer, physically disassemble this engine and scrape the carbon out of it and put it back together with new gaskets. I said to a Lexus rep one day, are you guys flipping kidding me here? Is this your new 9K service for your Lexus cars? Tear the engine apart and physically scrape it, put it back together. They didn't want to hear about chemistry, guys. Let me tell you what. I can do everything that this Lexus recall does in 44 hours in less than 20 minutes of running an oil chemistry through the car. Clean, clean in 20 minutes. Really clean. Okay. Now, this is where the problem starts. Okay. But the problem we're running into is technicians creeps all the way into variable valve timing, the lift controls, the phasers, the oil control solenoids. Guys, how many of these have we seen sludged up? How many of these have we seen that turn themselves into centrifuges and just keep packing sludge up in there until they don't move anymore or something inside breaks? We see it every day. Comes down to deposits. We got to diagnose them. This is the area, again, of this waveform I use, the gas exchange section. I actuate it and measure the movement, and I unactuate it and measure it at idle. I get my answer right then and there if I've got a problem inside that phaser or carbon impaction preventing that thing from moving. Another great part of that waveform. So here's what we want to do tonight to close this up. If you want to believe in any chemistry's power to solve drivability issues, test it yourself and pull the data because here's what we did on this car, okay? We got a 15 to 20 minute cleaning, right? Now I want to be very clear about this. In the maintenance dose, we want to clean for 15 to 20 minutes. That's normal and that's fine. But guys, diagnostically, if you're going after any of these oil control issues that I've just discussed with you, especially this one with the rings, guys, what we need to do is run this cleaner hot idle for an hour to two hours of runtime. And that, I promise you, in 90% of the cases or more, is going to free these rings up so like brand new wait till you see what we did on this car we did for this class justin you want to add anything before we roll into this no, let me, let me have you roll into this now because here's your car okay <laughs> there you go so tell us real quick about this and let's get to the data so we can let these guys get to sleep sounds good Th thanks gary so um i mean one of the key points that gary and i are really trying to drive home which uh, you did a great job of doing and the reason we chose to discuss this topic of carbon with everybody is this. Um, the carbon buildup, sludge, or gorilla snot, as, as uh, Gary calls it, whatever it's being called, its effects are being felt in many different forms. Uh, some of these features uh, you know, that we're showing you tonight is, is shown how to use this chemical in our diagnostic strategy and knowing the signs. And so knowing what tools to use and, and why we use them. So I've been really excited to try and show everybody, um, you know, just what this ATS treatment can do. And I've done it with my own, uh, my own car. So here's my 2015 Honda Pilot. Um, it's a fantastic car. It's been giving me uh, a couple of key indicators. Um, some I, here's, some I, Euro guy there, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Key, key in point, right? Right. <laughs> Sorry, so, dudes. Uh, I had to put that in there. No, no. Yeah, listen. I, I have a, I have a Jeep and I have a Honda, so I work on BMWs and Mercedes. So it gives you kind of a, a good good answer there. But we know where the money is. So um, <laughs> this is uh, you know this this car has been great. It, it's been with me since new. Um, it's got ninety six thousand miles on it, um, but it is giving me some uh, you know it's it, it's giving me some experiences that I'm having a little bit of an issue here. So. Um, the oil indicator, uh, for instance, is starting to show up a little bit earlier. Um, it's telling me that the uh, oil service is due earlier and earlier, I should say. Um, and I suspect that this car is going to start to have an oil consumption issue. So I've inspected the oil level, um, and it, you know, to my surprise, you know, a few hundred miles earlier than uh, some of the previous oil services, it's it's low. Um, so I should note. Um, Free and clear now. I've never gone over mileage on this car. Never, ever have I ever gone over mileage on changing my for oil. Main, for, main, for maintenance, yeah, right? Never, yeah. never. That never happens. My wife drives this. It's perfect. Yeah, right. So you got a slight intermittent, right? So uh, misfire when it's cold. It's not bad right. to a dead hole yet, right? Nope. Nope. And then yeah, just a little uh, bit of a rumble. Yep. yep. And then when you were pulling this apart the day we did this, I, I recall our note here. Um, 
which was the plug built up with sludge, right? And one of the cylinders that came out that we were testing. So um, as I mentioned, and Justin, just jump in here anytime you want. All, we're, all we did with this car, guys, nothing else happened to this car, but this can going into the oil system before the oil change, right? And we simply install the product and we let it run in a hot engine, let's say for maintenance purposes, 15 to 20 minutes, drop the oil, change the oil, you're good to go. In this case, because we're going after an oil control problem and we're looking at diagnostic end of it, we ran this car well better than an hour. Wouldn't you say, Justin, maybe about an hour and a half on this car? I ran it through its paces for sure. Okay, so I wanna be very clear about that again, guys. Oil control problems or fixes that we're trying to do, 15 minutes is not enough. Run it, run it, run it, and then drain it after about an hour or two. I like an hour and a half to two hours for oil control issues. Now, yeah. now Justin, uh, so just know, we, yeah, we can yeah. go over this real quick. You guys can see it on the screen. I know it's getting late, the nine o'clock bell's ringing, so I want to get us <laughs> through this without without losing what we're trying to show you. But, but uh, you can really see here right, Justin, that we've got two very low cylinders on this car, cylinder two and cylinder three. The rest of them are, are pretty decent, you know, for a car with 96,000 miles on it. Matter of fact, really decent. You know, this one's starting to drop a little too, right? Yep. So we've got two, three, and five that are kind of low in the engine compared to the rest of them. And guys, the reason that we took pictures wasn't to, we just wanted you guys to see that this is this particular car and the next one we're going to show you we're done right for this purpose to show you the real results rather than looking at somebody's boroscope pictures on the internet okay that's the whole purpose behind this so if you look each one of our compressions are recorded here by picture and recorded here um, with the cylinder number now remember this thing was run for about an hour and a half or so my recollection is here's what we have after Justin, you want to take us through this? Because I'm going to just keep flipping back and forth while you're doing that so these guys can see. We really made a tremendous compression correction on this engine that's going to relate to power, fuel economy, and smooth idle. Yeah, I think the data kind of speaks for itself. But, you know, we were noting that, you know, cylinder two and number three um, really had a pretty significant drop on the, on the initial. And then after we ran that through, they both really came up really nicely. Up. Yeah, yep. they woke up is what they did. Yep, now, for sure. guys, I'm going to tell you, this would not have happened this drastically with that 15 or 20 minute uh, maintenance time. Okay, that's the important thing to know here. When we're going after a fix, we need longer time in heat, right? This thing is, to me, uh, pulled an incredible correction. Uh, and this is why I like proof, because people can talk snake oil all day long. But as a technician, for me, when you put the proof in front of me or I see it on my own car right real time on the tools, that's all I need to, to look at that salesman and say, yes, it does work. Let's go ahead and talk about doing business. OK. Yeah. And so, you know, this takes the BS out of it, which is why I was really excited that Justin and I decided to actually do this. Um, and I think we're going to do it for some other stuff, too, just because it's yeah. fair and honest to test. Right. Yep. So. So stay tuned for that, guys. But anyway, um, check that out. OK, so we pulled a tremendous amount back in these in these cylinders in the, and we put a little comparison together to show you. We've got the cylinder before and after, as you can see. And then in green, we've got how many pounds came back in correction and what the percentage was. So you can see that in. In these cylinders that were down, we've got a tremendous correction. And in the cylinders that weren't clogged up ring-wise, we got no correction. What is that telling us? That telling us this is about as real deal and honest as you can get for results on a car. Because if that thing didn't have a ring problem, it's not gonna move the compression. So obviously cylinder number six in this case didn't have the buildup the others did for some reason, whether it be airflow or fuel flow or combustion temperatures or whatever. But guess what? If I'm diagnosing this car, I got some real data that I got to fix here, don't I? Absolutely. Now, if if you want to tie this together with really how strong this is, I've personally seen, and I do this a lot, guys, with different chemistries. I've seen different ring chemistries, including this one, pull back 30 pounds or more. 
on my Volvo that some of you guys know, the Diag Wag, the 1998 Volvo with 300,000 miles on it, I pulled 40 pounds per cylinder back on cylinder three and four and got rid of a wicked oil consumption problem on that car using the same product. We won't go through that car tonight, but I'm just telling you, out of my car, on my engine, 300,000 miles, two cylinders, 40 pounds low, right back with a long run time here like you see here. It works. Now, when we're doing the induction side, we'll fly through this because this is a visual for you guys that we put together. Everybody's curious how it works. We have an A, B, and C chemical here. We're going to simply load them into the bottles very quickly in the back. In this case, we worked on a 2016 Mini Cooper, okay, with only 54,000 miles. This, I think, was Chip's niece's car. And when we say new vehicle owner, she had just acquired it, if I remember correctly, Justin. Correct. Yep. Right? And this thing had a concern. She says, geez, it, it doesn't have a lot of power. It won't get out of its way. And she described it as a spongy gas pedal. So we hooked it up, did some boroscoping. It was nasty in there, okay? Not exceedingly nasty because it only has 54,000, but we went and hooked nice up the engine. What's that? It had a nice knot on that valve. Yeah, it sure did have a nice knot on the valve, okay? And a knot hanging down off the guide uh, boss too, right? So even though it's only 54,000, it's it's got some interruption and airflow here and some drivability. So what we're gonna do here, guys, is whoops, is we're going to, whoops, I whoopsed again. We're gonna go ahead and hook up a 12 volt supply to the battery on the vehicle. That's gonna power the machine. And then we're gonna go into a central port in the intake, EVAP, something like that, a purge port or something in the center of the intake, as close to the center of the intake as we can get with these special adapters. The instruction in the kit will kind of guide you as to which adapter to use, but we're all technicians. We can see visually what we need to do here, different sizes for different ways to adapt into the engine. Then we're gonna simply hook up the air hose to the machine here at the airport. Uh, the airport, hmm, that's interesting, right? Then we're gonna attach the atomizer into that central intake uh, evap or PCV port. Um, and this is what I just wanna say a uh, mention on right away. Um, this is the solenoid block that's gonna be delivering the A, B, and C chemical through the engine. Guys, this is designed to be a layered effect. So it's going to toggle A and B back and forth and layer and clean and layer and clean. And the tail end of the service, it will just toggle the C solenoid as the rinse. Now the big thing before I flip this slide is this clamp. I want you to notice the wire on this clamp. This clamp not only holds the solenoid block onto the engine so that it's not flopping around during the service, but that uh, wire is an accelerometer in the tip of this. And that's designed as a safety feature. So if you walk away from the car and it stalls because it becomes overpowered by chemistry or whatever, that accelerometer will stop moving and the machine immediately defaults to the off position so we don't load the engine with liquid product. Very, very important safety feature and a very nice design in this to keep technicians out of trouble. Now, it's a fairly automated process, guys, and we can literally go through it this quickly. You verify power with this green light once you hook the battery up. You then select the number of cylinders. You've got about a 12-minute run at three and four cylinder setting down to a seven to eight minute run at eight to 10 cylinders. So it's gonna deliver more product quicker in a bigger engine, less product slower to not overwhelm the smaller one. So step two is just gonna be select the number of cylinders on the panel. Three is going to be press your arm disarm button. When that light comes on, you're armed and ready to start the service. We're then going to verify over here, once we're armed that our verified pressures are where they should be. They're both regulated here with this blue hash mark at 40 PSI. We wanna give that a quick look and make sure our pressures are where they're supposed to be. And then we're gonna press the start clean button. Now from here, guys, it's 100% automated machine-wise. You do have to go in and sit and, and run that throttle at 2,000 to 3,000 RPM as Bernie's instructions ask you to. Reason for that is we've got to be able to pull the chemistry, not let it pool, and hold that throttle motor at a fairly steady high RPM, which is anybody that's tried it will tell you it's virtually impossible to do with a throttle stop on an electronic throttle car. So 
this machine will babysit itself once you press the start clean button. In case of emergency, for example, if you suddenly are sitting in the car revving it and you see fluid going everywhere and you need to get out and get that machine stopped quick, that's your panic emergency button right here, okay? Hard emergency stop. If you just come up and slap that and it will stop the machine in its tracks. Justin, let, would you tell him tell them the difference between slapping that button to shut it off and letting it run its course? Because if we let it run its course, Justin, it's going to do something real neat for us if it stalls, right? Right. So a couple of points. So uh, you mentioned the accelerometer, uh, and there's also a, a vacuum sensor inside as well on the nozzle. Uh, those are two, like you know, considered fail safes on there, so that if the engine does stop at any point, the chemical will stop being delivered as well as if the engine loses vacuum, it will also stop delivering the chemical itself. So if there's no vacuum, no chemical delivery happens. Um, nice. Just a quick point on a BMW, you would unplug the valve, uh, the Valtronic motor, and it would actually close the throttle plate to create the vacuum, because uh, those right. cars run on such low vacuum. Um, right. But to your point, the reason that we have a stop button is once it, it does actually um, finish the cleanings, you're going to notice that the, the alert is just very, very loud and a very obvious I'm done alert happens. But what you're noting now is at any point in time during the cleaning, um, even if you need to stop, maybe a phone rings or someone needs to ask you a question, um, you can actually shut the machine down by just shutting the car off. As soon as the, the car is off, the machine may make a beep at you, but you can actually pick up where you left off. So it actually has a, a smart logic to it. So if you want to shut it down, just shut the car, the car off. The machine will pause itself because it's not running. And when you're done, you hit the start button and continue going on your way. Yep, that's a great feature. And that's why I wanted Justin to point it out because a lot of times, you know, no matter whose product you're using, sometimes it'll overwhelm the motor and stall it. And uh, one of the things I ran into as a new user on this was that when it stalled, I'd smack that button. And then as soon as you do that, Justin, right? It takes and makes you start all over again. So it screws up where you were in the service. So yep. that's why uh, your point is great about running it in automated mode and just look, if the car stalls, cycle the key, start it up, punch your start button, you're right back doing your service. So that's right. thank, thanks for that point. So here's some before and afters on uh, the actual cleaning done with the chemistry. You can see that we're very, very effective even if we're lightly deposited or heavily deposited in getting the airflow restored around this valve area and the valve intake area. Um, on the data, when we get done cleaning the car, okay, you can see the baseline discussion we had earlier, guys, how much this plays in to that drivability. We're going from negative 13 on the throttle to negative three, okay. Um, I, not on the throttle, I'm sorry, on long-term fuel trim rather. And then our throttle motor corrected from six to three. And when it did so, look what it did to the injectors. Brought it right back down to that eight tenths of a millisecond baseline supposed to, that it's supposed to be running at, right? Um, we also reduced engine load a considerable amount and our injector pulse reduction was 19.4% at idle divided by two equals about say 10 PSI roughly without getting a calculator out. For that point four, okay, so nine and a half to ten percent correction on fuel economy. Do we want to quote that to a customer? No, no, because you're going to have your idiots out there with their calculators and their odometers and calling you. I only got seven and a half percent. You guys ripped me off. This is for your knowledge, guys. Okay, but you can look that customer in the eye square and tell them, yeah, you're going to see a fuel economy improvement with the car how much is gonna be up to your driving habits and what you're feeding it. That's the way I leave that discussion. Smooth running values on this mini, big time correction. Smooth running values are basically, uh, for those in the Euro world that are familiar with it, it's basically an individual cylinder trim where the DME is able to take away or add up to about 3% fuel on each individual injector to adjust for environmental conditions. If you look at this data real quick, this tells a story too. Here we have one cylinder, subtracting 1.31% and cylinder three, two cylinders down, adding 1.3. And then we got a couple here, you know, that are just doing some moderate correction. 
But the beauty of getting this thing cleaned and baselined is we can look at what's happened after we've done. Now, after we're done, we go from the big knot and dirtied up to a nice, clean, smooth valve area, right? And look at our corrections. 131 subtract to 002. That's virtually no adjustment at all. A little bit of a, uh, action and adjustment here, here, and here. But I want you to notice how much more consistent and smooth the engine is as compared to this. So guys, when we go into the deal here tonight, I want you to keep in mind the triangulation we're putting together here with this data in these cars that Justin and I did to kind of prove to you that out of the classroom discussion wise, there's a big difference between snake oil and products that get real results. And there's a very credible technical argument to be using this much more heavily in your diagnostic and repair attempts before we go yanking motors down to do expensive repairs. So hopefully the data that we've shown you between the fuel system corrections, the baseline corrections on the scan data, the compression corrections, which are huge in those turbo GDIs, and then our DME data here, hopefully will convince you as it did us, wow, this stuff really does get a result. It's nice to anecdotally talk about it, but it's great to see it in real life. So what Justin did, because in full disclosure, the way we presented this to you guys is this was a by popular demand class that people wanted more information on this system, which is why we did the car with it and the data and everything. We put a deal together for you, Justin did, that basically we know that a good number of you that are on are that close to doing this system anyway you just wanted to see the information and how it works on the car so what we decided to do is put together a real cool little incentive for you guys where there's a pretty good discount for getting this done for yourself uh, by the 21st of december i'm going to let justin jump in and tell you what the deal is real quick and it is 917, Justin, so we'll go through this as quick as we can for these four guys. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, we, we have a couple of different options, and, and the truth of it is uh, the machine's always going to be included with it, and there's a couple of things that are, are standard um, within each kit. So it really kind of decides on how much chemical you want to start with. Uh, so we put together uh, an attractive offer, which is like the fast start, uh, 3695. It'll include the machine and 12 vehicle treatments. Um, you know, and most shops seem to, you know, on average find about a $300, um, you know, a, a cleaning in, in, in that to their customer. So we equate that to about a return on investment to about $3,600, you know, dollars in, uh, in your initial investment, which is paid off. Um, so, so you get that, yep. So that's on this deal here, right? Correct. So on the fast start, you pretty much have paid your machine down um, those with those 12 treatments. And we'll kind of get to uh, a little bit more on how that works in another slide or two. We'll we'll, we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, okay, but it will it, it will come with an oil treatment, uh, three oil treatments, and a three fuel treatments as a sample. Uh, you will get a counter display, so it's a video, a little TV screen with a rolling before and after, which will help you discuss that with your customers and they can ask questions and look at the effect of what we're doing. Um, cool. Yep. And then the pro kit. Again, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, uh, it's, it's a powerful, you know, uh, point of sale uh, target here and you do get some brochures to reinforce what we're saying. Um, yep. So again, and the pro kit is again, uh, it depends on how much chemical you initially plan on using. Um, so for 54.95, your ROI would would still be quite significantly different. Uh, different. All right. So I'd right, because guys, that's the the whole purpose behind the 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 deal here. And this is how they sell it normally. This isn't the special yet. Okay, it it, it is the special, um, but it, this is kind of normally how it's set up to sell return on investment wise, meaning. Uh, you know, you can see in the 10 case model, there's a tremendous amount of gross profit there, uh, which actually in that case almost pays the equipment back three times on the on the 10 case deal. Uh, mm -hmm. The one case deal gets you in and then lets you reorder when you want to, but it still almost pays off the entire piece of equipment for you um, at the end. So 
what we decided to do was something cool because we had several guys that said to us, we're coming to this thing, but we're already pretty much in. So what we decided to do was a neat cumulative uh, incentive for you guys to, to pile on together and pull a tremendous retail discount back. Go ahead, Justin, with this slide. So what we're going to probably end up doing is, and Gary, if you have that link, I think you can you can either share it on the chat. Oh with yeah, them. let let me get that up there now. Yep. All right. So what we can do is we'll, we'll we're going to email you guys as well uh, for those that attended in here. Um, you know, grouping this Justin, together. I'm going to just back out of this for a second to get to sure, what I need. Sure. That That's okay. Uh, so basically, with with a group discount, um, with everybody you know coming here tonight, and as a thank you. Well, we're going to put together a nice offer where as a group effort, we can get five shops that were looking for the equipment before December 21st. Um, we're end up going to give you uh, some extra cases of chemicals. So for the first five shops that sign up on our link, we will end up giving you an extra case uh, for the, with the, which is basically a retail value of about $1,200 uh, on top right. of that initial investment. Right? So, um, in addition to that, if, you know, if we get 10 guys in there and 10 shops that want this, we're going to give you two extra uh, cases of chemical. Yep. Go back one slide. Yep. Right. Yep. So, it, so you'll get a $2,400 retail value, right? So the more chemical you can get, uh, the more cleanings you can sell, and the more money you're going to make, right? 20 or more yeah. shops looking to participate, great. We're going to give you three extra cases, and that's per, for every one of those uh, orders per shop, right? So right. we, we sent out a link. Um, we will send you guys an email as well. Uh, sign up. You want some more information, you can still sign up on there too. We left you a little questionnaire on, on what you're looking for. Um, if you're just looking for some more information, that's fine too. And we will we'll give you a call tomorrow and throughout the week and let us know what you think. Uh, and by the way, if you have a way to you know let us know how we did, uh, I think you go to the, you know, the, we'll go to the questions in the last slide, Gary, but you know, if you guys want to see some more of this and you want to see some more uh, different types of case studies, let us know what you'd like to see uh, and how you'd like us to test it and see. But based on, right. you know, how how Gary and I have set this uh, set this up, you know, the data tells a, a great story. And Gary, uh, if I didn't say this already, thank you very much for, for having us. And we really appreciate sure. it. It's been great doing this with you. I really love to be able to take something that we teach in a training class and physically prove it. because there's so much, you know, debate out there. Does it work? Does it not? Is it snake oil? Is it not? And I'm teaching these classes and I never get the chance to answer these questions in this format, meaning show the actual data on a car, which is pretty cool. I do have a couple of things I want to point out right now. We do have some really great questions here in about two and a half seconds. We're going to open it up for those questions, but I'm getting a couple of comments that say the links don't work. I found that when Justin sent them to me too, that I have to hit the control key and then click it at the same time to make it work. It, for some reason, it's not like a normal link. Uh, I don't know why, but we, you know, here's the thing. Anybody that can't get that link to work tonight by hitting control and clicking on that link, if it doesn't actively move, um, we, will send, we will send these links out to you in the thank you email, okay? We'll make sure that everybody that's registered and attended tonight um, gets the links, okay? It, they should work. I can't test them now because I'm running the webinar, but I posted them in there and they should work. If you click control and then click the link itself, it should go there. If it doesn't, wait for the follow-up email, guys, and we'll get them to you. Now, Justin, if it's okay with you, um, you know, I just want to just real quick, um, thank you guys for being here on my own behalf. Um, just uh, encourage you, if you would, to go look at the real neat things, uh, that we're doing out at diagnation.com. Our membership area is right here. You can read about our uh, remote technical support and programming memberships. We have incredible instructors, uh, aligned with us. Uh, these guys are all some names that you'll know. Um, and some of you, uh, so, some of these guys are my personal friends and I know and love them and I, I know you guys do too. So check us out guys, you know, in the COVID age, we're trying to be a great group of grassroots, hardworking guys 
um, that are trainers and support guys that are really trying to interact with you guys on the shop level without having to have uh, that corporate interaction between us. So we put together a really neat thing here for you guys for support memberships, uh, for instructors. And if you just check the products out real quick, all of our uh, product lines, ATS, uh, lab, uh, Diagnation, TP Lab Scopes, Launch Diagnostic Equipment, Drew Technologies, all those are available through us at Diagnation. The beautiful thing about hanging with us when it comes to this kind of thing is we fully hands-on from the ownership level support every single thing we sell. So there's a million places you can buy it, but we're gonna take really good care of you. Over here, if you need support on a car you're stuck on, we got a couple areas you can get in. One is memberships. If you don't want a membership right away, you pick up a couple support cases, click this button, and we give you a six-digit code and we're logged into your tool. Okay, um, and then finally, one other real quick thing, if you'll indulge me just for a second, is this. I think you guys are really gonna love this. If you come into the training area and go live classes, right? And we come over here, whoops, this thing keeps jumping around on me, hold on now. Live classes, advanced lab scope, okay? You can have basic, interme intermediate, or advanced lab scope. Check out how cool this is. Click an option, choose your lab scope, and then it gives you all of the instructors that will hands-on teach you basic, intermediate, or advanced lab scope, direct connection, live on a car at your shop. Guys, Diagnation's here to help you. We're here to help you solve technical problems, and we're really uh, uh, humbled and appreciative of Justin doing this with us. Um, I think we had a great time doing it, proving what this thing does on the street. Um, and with that said, uh, what I'd like to do is basically open up um, uh, answer a few of these questions and uh, just so you guys know that are sticking with us if you have a question that I'm not going to answer that's written down here um, there should be a raise hand icon if you want to raise your hand and unmute your mic I'll see that and I'll let you come on live and ask a question so let me start at the top of the list um, it says is this uh, presentation available for download um, yes, we can make it available for download. And the other thing that I believe we're going to have available for you guys is you'll all be able to go back in with a link and watch this afterwards. I'm going to turn it on so you can go back and watch it again. Um, next question. How does this system compare to the MotorVac carbon cleaning system? Really, really good question, Ernest. Um, they're so different, it's not even funny. Um, the Motivac is a soap-based product, and our ATS is a combination of patented products, which we really don't know because they're patented and secret formula, but we know that they completely differ in chemistry from both the BG uh, uh, side, where they're using primarily petroleum products to clean, and Motivac, which is primarily using soap-based products to clean. Okay, so that's the big difference, Ernest, is that your Motivac um, is going to be on a time sequence similar, but it is cleaning the intake differently. It's dealing with the injectors differently. And the solution that we're running in that Motivac machine is apples and oranges different from what you're looking at here with the ATS. Um, can we add one more thing to that? Yes. Yeah. So uh, our, our chemicals are actually using an accelerant as well. So one of the nice things are actually one of the only things that uh, I could say is nobody else has been doing something like that uh, quite right. the same. So when right. it actually goes into the combustion chamber and when we take the carbon, it's all being burned up uh, in the combustion chamber. So we're not really leaving anything behind to get caught up in the uh, turbos or into the catal uh, catalyst. Um, we've monitored that extensively. And we've, those yep. accelerants actually do that job perfect. Yep. Good point. All right. We're going to just keep going down. It's definitely getting late. Yeah, yeah, I see guys dropping off. I totally get it. And those of you that are dropping off, I want to thank you so much for your time. And I know Justin does too. Let me get to a couple more questions. Um, uh, where can I find the deposit class? The, that's a great question, David. Um, we can find it in numbers of places. We run it on WorldPack all the time. We run it at Vision, ATE, 
um, Apex, uh, all the various shows that are obviously now being done online. We run it all over the place. So keep your eye on social media, on the World Pack online. Um, and then uh, um, if you go to the diagnation and just sign up as an account, you don't have to spend any money, but if you just sign up so we know you're there, we can make sure that you're on that list as well. Um, so that's how you would find that class. Now on uh, next question, Joseph DeLuca on GDI intermittent misfire screen, why no change on the gas exchange section of the graph? Let me reread that so I know how to answer it. On the GDI intermittent misfire screen, why no change on the gas exchange? Oh, okay. I think I know what you're talking about, Joseph. We had three graphics up. The top one was where I was showing you the intermittent drops. I'm hoping that that's the one that you're referring to. And then the ones that were a little more zoomed in down on the bottom um, were not zoomed in enough for us to actually physically see that change. I think that's the best way I can describe that to you for the way that was set up for that slide was a more of an out view to show you the intermittent via, uh, via valve rotation. So I don't think I had either of those three graphics in enough. Um, to change that. Now, if you were referring to the slide a couple back where we had known good and really bad leak at three pounds, that did change the gas uh, uh, exchange area drastically as you saw. But on the one I think I was referring to that you're questioning, it's the fact that we just weren't zoomed in enough to see that resolution. Hopefully that answers the question. I'll, I'll roll on to another one. And Joseph, if, if it didn't shoot me another question, I'll get to it down at the bottom. now. Um, Ronald Cobb asks, do you find cylinder on demand engines have more of a piston ring problem with plug fouling? Yes, 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 Ronald. Great question. These Hondas that we're talking about, not necessarily Justin's wife's car, but the automatic uh, uh, cylinder control cars, the Chevys, the Chryslers, the Hondas, especially the Hondas have wicked coking on those back three cylinders, one, two, and three. Those are the ones that are being shut off during active cylinder management. Because there's so much cooling and heating going on with the transfer of the valves operating and then not running a cool exhaust gas going to a suddenly hot combustion gas, those cylinders in AVM cars get a lot of ring coking and baking. Great question. Yes, yes, yes is the answer. On those cars, you wanna really run that, you know, one hour plus run time, Ronald, to get the effect that you need there. Now, the next question is Shane Johnson. Where can I buy the 505 oil and the fuel system treatment individually? Um, Justin, I think the answer to that is on your website, correct? Yeah, it, why don't you email me? Um, we are we will work on that. So we have cases of that. Um, but if you send me an email, um, I will tell you or chat with me. I have a, a chat window on our atsCarbonClean.com site, um, yep. and I will show you how to get to that. Okay, because he's making the statement here in his next uh, statement that says pelicanparts.com sold individually. So you guys can have that discussion on the side. Yep. Um, we answered Vic's question, I hope, on the link not working. Vic, I don't know if you got that link working. It looks like you're still with us. Uh, so hopefully it's working for you. Um, had another gentleman say thank you for the uh, class. You're welcome. Uh, very, very... Uh, humbled to be here and I thank you guys for your time more than you should be thanking me. It's late and we've been working on cars all day. Uh, a couple final questions. Is there a way, and this is from Matt, okay, Summerdick, uh, is there a way to use data and scope to identify poor injector spray pattern? The data and waveforms we saw tonight appear to show us a lot about airflow, but not so much about the injectors, thanks. Matt, fantastic question. And just because this was an hour, which is now an hour and a half, there just is way too much on that to get into. But here's the quick answer to your down and dirty question. Uh, yes, there is ways that we can, yes, there are ways to use properly English that we can use our scopes to, should I say, to have a pretty doggone good idea what's going on with those injectors. The big problem, as you know, with injectors is we can't physically see the spray. So we can use all the data we want to correlate, but we still can't see the spray. So to answer your question quickly, what I do is I use a fuel trim test whereby I let the idle stabilize. I get a long-term fuel pressure, a long-term 
fuel trim reading on that bank mat. And then I disconnect the injectors one at a time and let the engine idle for two full minutes to let that fuel trim adjust. I record that fuel trim data, reconnect that injector, go to the next one, do the same thing across both banks. What we're gonna find, and again, we don't have time to teach this in this class tonight, but what we're gonna find is that if we have adders of subtractors using that method, we can identify and target either a non-performing injector or a leaky injector. That has to go to another class and another night, but that's a down and dirty quick answer. The answer is yes, you can absolutely get some good ideas about what's going on with the injectors. Um, so thank you very much, Matt, for that question. Uh, Joseph DeLuca says, yes, the links worked, I think, right? So that's or, 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 uh, answered my question, yes. And Vic says, yes. So we have a yes and a yes on the links and the other questions asked. Uh, Jamie uh, asked the question, very good one, actually. Should you drive the vehicle with the oil treatment? Great question. Answer from me is no. If Justin wants to tell you something different, go ahead, Justin. But my answer is no. And the reason is, uh, we don't want, when we have a cleaning chemistry in the motor, uh, we don't necessarily want to put that thing under heavy load, right? So would it hurt it if we drove it around? No, it wouldn't. And I'll tell you why, because I drove my Volvo around 45 minutes before I drained it. But I think the correct technical answer to your question as far as relating to servicing your customers' cars, I personally would not go hop it around under heavy load with a cleaner in the engine. That's just me, um, and I, I would think, agree. I would agree I with think you. That, that has to be our official answer, so we're not hurting yeah. engines. Okay, um, so uh, hopefully that uh, answered your question there, Jamie. Um, David, uh, thank you very much for your comments. He says great class. I appreciate that. And then Eduardo uh, has a final question here. Um, so, not a final question, but hold on, Eduardo, this keeps jumping around. There we go. Eduardo's asking, will we be allowed to see this webinar in a pre-recorded video? Got here late and missed it. The answer, Eduardo, is yes. We are going to have uh, the video available for you to go up and look at. Uh, I'm going to make sure tomorrow morning, it's getting a little late East Coast time here, as you guys know. I'm going to make sure tomorrow morning it's all set up to do that. If you go try to watch it tonight, you're probably not going to be able to get to it, or maybe you will. But by tomorrow, I'll make sure that that link is active. The reason I say that, guys, is that when we shut this webinar down, it takes an equal amount of time to render it and get it on the site than it did to teach it. So at the very, very, very earliest, the system would have it available probably around midnight. Um, Ross uh, McPherson says, thank you very much, guys. Very interesting piece of equipment. Thank you, Ross, for attending. I appreciate it. Vic Leon has one final question. Have you found that this cleaning method causes issues? I remember some carbon cleaners back in the day would actually wash the cylinder walls. Great question, Vic. The answer is the technology is way beyond that today. So the answer to your question is no. We're not going to be washing cylinders. Um, the, the chemical that we're using here is surfactants and um, dispersion chemistry to answer your question specifically to the extent that when it's cleaning a deposit, it's cleaning it from the top down and it's pulling it out in dispersion form, meaning very slowly at a time, uh, so that we're not following the converter and we're not dropping mud into the cylinders, and mud meaning loose, wet carbon. So Vic, I hope that answered your question. We are not seeing those kind of issues with any kind of normal mainline fuel injection cleaner that I've been using now uh, for years. We don't to really see that problem anymore at all. Um, the uh, David McCormick does ask a cool question here. Would this be good for a port injected car? Absolutely, David. And I'll go one beyond that. Uh, we tried it in a carbureted hot rod the other day. Works great on those two. You just kind of kind of clip the nozzle to the top of the carburetor. Okay. But yes, it would work great in a port fuel injected car. Any kind of car that's going to be backed up or affected by carbon. Uh, we're going to get some good result with this. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, Jamie, one more question. Do I have to find shops to get free chemicals? No, Jamie. The, the incentive we put together for you guys 
just means that if five of you or 10 of you or 20 of you buy, you get more and more free product. You don't have to sell for us. This was an offer that they put together for you guys specifically for your time and knowing that some of you are ready to make a move on the product. So all this is going to do is make you a little more money the more and more people that buy it. No selling involved, my friend. Thank you very much for the question. Um, now, I'm pretty sure that we got everybody's question done. Um, one thing I will point out before we kiss you guys goodnight is that uh, do stay in touch with us and watch for the emails from Justin because this offer we did for the more people that buy, the more free product you get as customers that are participating is trackable. And Justin's going to be sending you the link for tracking that. So, so Jamie, to answer your question, you, you guys can sit there over the next few days and watch who's doing stuff and who isn't to gain that uh, uh, increased uh, product incentive. So guys, with that said, Justin, I want to turn it over to you because my lips have been flapping for quite a while now. Um, before I do turn it over to you, I want to thank you guys very, very much for spending time with us tonight. I hope you got all the answers that you were looking for when you signed up. Please keep an eye out for uh, our deposit classes, the full four hours. You'll get a lot more out of it diagnostically. And again, I humbly ask you to go check out Diagnation and maybe check out our Facebook page and like and share us a bit. Help us spread the good word about what we're doing. Justin, it's all you. Yeah, I, I really want to thank you too. So um, Diagnation has been a, a great help. Uh, I know many of you for uh, a number of years now. And you got a great crew and uh, I know you're going to support your customers. And I know a lot of customers that you've already been supporting. So thank you very much for all the things you're doing. And the training that you guys provide, uh, I mean, it's it's outstanding. Um, my pleasure, man. My pleasure. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. Uh, and yeah, I mean, to go to just go back to the offers and stuff. Um, you know, anybody wants that? That's all for you guys and everybody that's on the the webinar. If you have some shops that you want to show this to, or friends in the business that 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 want to join or have an interest, you can sign them up. Let them watch the webinar, and uh, by all means, share that link. It's only going to benefit. Uh, you guys at the end right. of the day. Exactly. Yep. And we'll be here for any questions. So take our emails down, you know, anything ATS I can answer a question for. I know Gary's always answering questions, uh, uh, feeling questions all day long. So all day. Check out day. The shell That's answer, man. The <laughs> name of the game, name of the game, you know, uh, saving lives, fixing cars and saving lives. That's what we got to yep. do. I always like to say, guys, we got it hard here in the world of broken hearts and broken parts. So everybody keep a smile on your face. If I don't see you guys between now and the holidays, have a fantastic holiday. Stay safe. Don't catch the Rona and give us a call or email us if you need anything. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. With that, we're going to go ahead and end the webinar. Have a fantastic evening.